Hey everyone, welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast. I'm Steve and we do this show every week uh, in order to um, uh, help promote aquaponic growing and cannabis growing uh, as well as different things in the uh, uh, cannabis and aquaponic industry. Uh, we try to touch on a, a wide variety of things. Um, this week we have Roger, as always, from uh, I Love Growing Marijuana. Thanks for joining us, Roger. And welcome. Welcome to all our new guests and our regular panel. Happy Thursday. <laughs> we got Marty. Cheers, everybody. And we got our guest today, Jeremy. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Um, welcome to the show, Jeremy. Well, Thank you. Thanks. Um, I have a, a quick plug here um, for Ouroboros. If you guys are interested in taking a commercial aquaponics class, uh, his commercial aquaponics class will be uh, the 11th, 12th, and 13th. I will also be teaching part of that class. So if you're interested in learning uh, commercial aquaponics from both uh, me and Ken Armstrong over at Ouroboros in beautiful Half Moon Bay, California, definitely check that out. Um, uh, as well as uh, I'll be teaching the medicinal herb class on the 15th and 16th and the aquaponic cannabis class on 19th and 20th all at Ouroboros Farms. You can get more information at OuroborosFarms.com. Alrighty, um, this week we have uh, Jeremy from uh, Adler Packaging all the way over in uh, Maryland. I had a, a uh, awesome time getting a chance to meet him and hang out with him over at uh, the DGC Cup over in Colorado. Uh, we had a, a good old time. He was showing us all different kinds of different packaging options and all different kinds of different things over there. And uh, uh, he was kind enough to try and explain all the different kinds of cool ways that um, uh, there are to package your different cannabis products as well as some of the different regulations you run into when you, you're working in the cannabis industry and, and things like that. So thanks for joining us, Jeremy. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about what you guys do. Uh, yeah, so I work for a packaging distributor, and we're one of the largest mid-Atlantic uh, packaging distributors. So uh, most of what we work in is like is nutraceuticals and uh, uh, home and health care uh, type of product. So anything that goes inside of something else, we sell you the thing that it goes into. So uh, a lot of my office is dealing with sauces, with hair care products, with beers. We were uh, the bottle supplier for Weyerbacher beer for a while. Um, we, you know, we deal <coughs> in uh, a lot of local juices. We do Tezzy May sauces, if anybody has heard of that, who's in the New England area. Uh, so uh, that's really uh, the background of the company. It's an 85-year company, a lot of custom work, a lot of great work that they do. Uh, and uh, I have, since I've started there, we've uh, started branching out into working a lot more with cannabis companies. Uh, as regulation uh, and legalization has been moving forward, especially in the D.C. area, there's really been this void of a local company to service the, the 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 cannabis industry and make sure that they're properly taken care of in, in terms of their packaging uh, because well i mean there are a lot of, really a lot of the business of uh <laughs> what uh, steve what was that what okay um yeah all right. Yeah, don't look, don't look at Steve in the chat room if you're trying to keep a train of thought, okay? <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't learn the rules of being a guest. And uh, to anybody who's out there watching, this is probably going to be an incredibly boring podcast. Um, Steve and I are going to find it really interesting. And uh, uh, because I find this kind of stuff really fascinating, I make no guarantees for anyone else. Uh, but what I was saying was a lot of... Uh, uh, packaging and a lot of the cost in what you do actually really has to do with uh, freight. And so it's really important for uh, the cannabis industry to take that into account that if you're working with an online company, you're working with, uh, in your plastics, you're working guaranteed with solely Chinese goods. Uh, if you're working with your glass, it's solely Chinese goods that have been shipped and that's uh, that is a uh, cost. If, if you're dealing with a local company, we have access to local bottle blowers. Now, there are still no glasses being made in the United States, but we have access to local plastics companies and we can help people save on their cost and we can help group 
people together to uh, save everybody the most money that they possibly can. And that's something that you're, a lot of your online suppliers can't do for you. I don't know if that made any sense. Awesome. So what are the different kinds of packaging regulations you run into? Um, you know, I know you work with a lot of different states and different things, but you want to right. explain to people like some, so say someone's got a different, um, a new edible or some kind of other thing. What are some of the package uh, considerations that people need to do? Uh, well, you need to take into account your local uh, laws and regulations uh, because everything is different between uh, CRC, opaque, uh, now I understand that California is going with a clear uh, for edibles. Uh, so th everything is, is, a, is a mixed bag. And then you have DC, which is really just the Wild West right now. Um, so you know your local laws and know your local restrictions first. I, I'm fairly familiar with most of them, but I'm by no means uh, you know an absolute uh, expert on your local regulations. What I try to take into account with in, in general is that there is universally there's going to be CRC, there's going to be what we call a CRC is a, a child resistant closure at some point. There has to be some sort of child resistant. Everyone's focus is, has been uh, on, you know, must protect the children. Everyone has to think about the kids understandable with uh with a lot of uh the strength of some of these edibles uh so you know you we try to think about what is going to be universal you're going to need a crc you're going to need at some point you know either something clear or something uh opaque uh and it's probably going you know you're going to need it large blank areas when you're thinking about your art and your your artwork where your graphics are going to go you need to think about how are we going to put the local restrictions and regulations onto this package yeah, yeah. for each regular so that you so that when the regulation inevitably changes you're not throwing out ten thousand dollars worth of product that you just purchased and you just waited 12 weeks to get from wherever you got it from uh, and you know those are the types of things that, that I try to look at in terms of restrictions and try to help people work through so that you know they don't lose twenty five thousand forty thousand dollars worth of product yeah. do you do any foil packaging uh, what do you mean by foil? Like reclosable foil packs like they have now. That oh, everybody my can bags. Have. Oh, Sorry? yes. Oh, absolutely. We deal a lot in flexible packaging. Uh, we have a lot of uh, both American contacts, and then we have a lot of Chinese contacts as well. Um, most of your, again, I mean, really, most of your resins, most of your plastics are really going to be coming out of China right now, especially the Mylar bags in general. Uh, the the cost differential between American made plastics and Chinese plastics would blow your mind, uh, and it's an uphill battle for a lot of companies, especially companies that are starting out. Uh, so yeah, we we uh, try to offer people a lot of different options in that. Uh, I mean, what in particular would you like to know about Mylar bags? <laughs> Well, I was talking, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't know they were actually Mylar bags, but like uh, I see two, everything from, well, I've seen tuna fish packaged in it now. Right. I see, I see uh, uh, the nutrients from our company at ilovegrownmarijuana.com. Right. We've, got, we've got a new flower power fertilizer and right. it's a resealable Ziploc foil pack. And right. I found it to be, I said, wow, this is, this is and it appears that's where everybody's going, yep. you know, it, you know, in a way. So that's, I was wondering if that's, that's it wouldn't be childproof, though, I guess. But. Oh, no, no. There is a, we are working with a really cool company, American company, that has a childproof, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's really, it's a flexible bag, a flexible stand-up pouch is what we call it. I, I keep calling it Mylar, but it's not necessarily Mylar. What it really is yeah, is... You it, stand it up when you open it. It usually folds out in the bottom. It's thinner. Right. It's more at the top, and then it winds, and it's got a crease. So it's a pleat or whatever. It, we call that a gusset. We we uh, it's a gusseted bag. Yeah, so that's what um, I'm interested in. <laughs> what the, <laughs> so what those flexible though? Yeah, we deal a lot in those flexible plastics, and uh, those can be those actually have different 
uh, layers and they can be built in different ways for different permeability. So you could have HDPE layers, you could have PET layers, you could have nylon layers built into the bag because it's essentially layers of plastic built on top of each other okay. with, with injected resins. And it depends on which process it's going through, whether it's a digital process or is it a silk screening process or a, a or a, sorry, not a, it would be a spot treatment process. Uh, how, those bags get printed. So you can either inject them all with like a solid black layer, or you could put a layer of foil in there, or you could put some sort yeah. of craft paper layer on top. The The possibilities in building out those bags is really endless. And then you put the zipper on top. But we've got, uh, we're working specifically with a really cool company that uh, they have developed a child a resistant closure on the front of it where you have to grab a little front flap and then stick your thumb in the bag and pull them that way in order to open them. So it requires a little bit more force. It requires a little bit more thought. You know, this episode reminds me of that uh, SNL skit, you know, where they're always like, you can put your weed in. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you're that guy, man. Like, that's your new job. Like, no, that is literally like, my job. Never stop. You're like, you can put your weed in here, man. You, you don't understand. <laughs> that is literally my job right now. Uh, yeah, so, I was just thinking about that. That cracks me up. Yeah, like actually, this. on that <laughs> on that note, actually, uh, uh, the one of the companies I'm working with has a new. Uh, I can't talk about it on on air, but we have a new proprietary weed product that has a particular kind of uh, consistency to it that is makes it pretty interesting to try and figure out what the packaging is. And and he came up with a really awesome solution. Uh, for a delivery method for the particular issue that we were having in regarding to trying to figure it out. So that's cool. Jeremy, this yep, is Roger. this is one of our packages. Oh yeah. Yep. With the ziplock at the top. This is off the starter pack. And yeah. you got it. And not that I don't, you know, appreciate that cool little bag, but do you have anything a little bigger? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> well yes, I have some of that somewhere. I got a few of those. I I need more storage room. Oh, I've got a, I've got some great big bags. So, um, actually, <laughs> I, well, I was saying actually, you know, uh, my uh, my first customer is uh, is real growers, the recharge. So we're moving them into flexible packaging out of their <laughs> out of their rigid packaging because yeah. uh, they're they were having a lot of problems with the tops popping off, uh, which is In transit. Well, no, it's yep. Yeah, it's a it's a combination of factors. I, it has a lot to do with the atmospheric pressure change from Fort Collins down. It has I to do. To, I used to have the same problem when we used to do we used to the same containers for iron to use at aquaponic source, mm -hmm. and we have the same problem where the, when they go to, to higher or, or when they go lower in altitude, it there was issues with it. So the other problem with that is actually that uh, pressure sensitive liner. That pressure sensitive liner has to be turned to 22 newtons of force, I believe. And you're doing that by hand. It's impossible to do that over and over and over again. It would, first of all, it'd be exhausting on your arm. So that seal is never going to hold ever. And you, and in order for a lot of the powdered nutrients for that seal to hold, you have to get in there with ISO and you have to really clean the edge of that wow good lord this is boring uh no no, no it's so not boring to... you're, you're, this is this is interesting there's a lot of people that work in the industry and listen to this stuff and you know and, I think... and we we all have projects that we're going to need packaging one day so you're probably getting picked on some uh, we're doing some research for all of our own companies right now Come talk to me, but it, you know, um, tell the viewers. I'm just kidding. Tell, well, you know, there's some stuff that we're doing locally that's really, really cool. And I, uh, you know, I'm getting back to I, can we, can you put your weed in there? You put your uh, weed in there. So, <laughs> this, <laughs> this, and I don't know if your uh, viewers can see this, this is actually uh, spec packaging that I'm doing for a, a Colorado company. They're working on, um, uh, they're working on it, uh, Canagar, and you want to show really that up excited. again? I got you, uh, the camera locked. Uh, well, I probably shouldn't show their <laughs> logo too much, but it's uh, because it uh, for Canagar. Yeah. It's a, for a Canagar. They're a new company that's coming out. This isn't their set artwork. I don't want to, yeah. you know, expose. But what this is is a PET preform. 
so it's really kind of cool. What this is is a PET uh, water bottle before it's blown out to be a bottle. It's just 54 grams of, of uh, polyethylene that uh, of resin that have, they've formed into this shape. And then when they put it into the machine, they'll pick up like 66 or 128 of them or you know, a massive amount of them. And they heat them up and they blow them into these molds uh, with a lot of hot air. And that becomes your water bottle. This bottle or this... Uh, this preform would probably is probably for at least a gallon, a gallon size uh, bottle. Cool, but, but you know, so we uh, and like we were uh, Steve and I were talking about a little bit before we went on air. There, this is really sort of the wild west for packaging because this is a whole brand new industry, and there's no set rules. There's no generations of looking at bottles and saying that bottle says hot sauce to me that bottle says liquor to me the, uh, you know that jar says hair care products we're pulling from absolutely every single industry and creating packaging that's that for a whole brand new industry and there are some really cheap options like using PET preforms that's everyone's dirty little secret where they can they're they're charging a little bit more for it because nobody knows what they are um but you know we we've got stuff from cosmetics industry what did, what did I do Sorry. like cool little makeup jars Right. This is for like Mac products. It's an amazing concentrate container. Straight, yeah, granola. But it's straight walls. So there's not that, that shoulder underneath there. You can get absolutely everything out of it. Just a beautiful, beautiful package. And it's something that when you start thinking outside of the box and saying, you know, can I put my weed in there? You know, right. uh, you really come up with... You, you, you come up with some really creative solutions. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that it's interesting too, because you have, uh, you know, a number of different sort of like needs inside of that market. You know, it talks about being its own market, but really you have different concerns for edibles. Yes. You do for flour that you do for concentrates, you know, yes. and even different kind, kinds of concentrates as well. So in different states, like, yes. you know, up until recently, Illinois, you, you know, you couldn't even uh, be able to see the cannabis that you were buying. You couldn't have a clear container. In other states, you had to have a clear container. So, you know, there's a, you know, like you were saying, there's a number of different things that determine what you end up having, having to use, I guess. Right. And that's why you're seeing a lot of pop tops everywhere. And you're seeing, you're seeing flexible bags and you're seeing pop tops because it's the most convenient and universally acceptable option. It's polypropylene resin. They, I think the molds for that thing, they're pumping out 128 of them every time the machine comes down. So, you know, you're, they're pumping out, you know, thousands of them, tens of thousands of them a day. They can do it in every color. Uh, and you can cover all the regulations because it's child resistant. It can be both transparent or it can be opaque. It can be any color you want it to be. It, it's polypropylene that everyone knows how to use and knows how to decorate. So it can take uh, silk screening. You know, everybody knows the chemical process for applying uh, labels and for uh, for inks that will work on the uh, the polypropylene plastic itself. So it's one of those uh, uh, universal products that, that has just become the accepted norm. The same way that you see shampoo in exactly the same bottle, in exactly the same type of plastic, unless it's in a unique bottle, in which case somebody spent a ton of money to buy a mold to blow something you know very specific for themselves. To make a tool. Yeah, yeah, because tooling is tooling is outrageously tool, expensive. Tool is what it's all about. Tooling is what it's all about. Yeah. Awesome. And what? so, do you have any like uh, like do you ever have any customers that are like concerned with like let's say uh, being less disposable? Like when you're talking about those plastic bags and stuff like that, 
or even a little bit more durable. Like one of the reasons I like glass is that, you know, like if I, you know, accidentally sit on it, I don't smash my entire bag of weed, for instance. Um, right. You know, so there are, you know, pros and cons both ways. But you also, you know, I feel like you have a lot of people with, are concerned with not having disposable bags and being able to reuse them. So, you know, when I'm done with what's in here, I can, you know, fill it back up again and, you know, be able to reuse it and not contribute to the large amount of plastics we have out there. So do you have options for those people as well? Well, the the market really creates the demand. I mean, it's uh, I if you when we start talking about mass production, uh, you have to. Sorry, let me back up. The short answer is kind of no right now because there's not enough demand for what we call PCR, which is post consumer resin. Uh, your your plastics that are high in recycled material are not as high of a quality and wouldn't be as not always as acceptable of a quality to the consumer. Uh, so, you know, if you're, if, when you get really high in your percentages of plastics, your colors are never stay the same. Your closures can become brittle. Uh, the, it, it, you start having a lot of problems with the quality of the bottle itself. So there's a, there's a huge trade off. But on the other hand, there's also not a large enough demand for <laughs> using things like uh, the, the, the PE, the fully sustainable sugar PE plastics or the resins that they're experimenting with that are made out of hemp. Uh, the, if the industry were to demand a large enough volume of those plastics, then we could have them. But as it stands right now, no. Um, because the, the, to get a lot of these people to turn on machines, you have to place an order of at least 150,000, you know, that's what they, that's what it costs for them to change the machine over to something else. You'll find companies that will do lower minimum orders, but it's few and far between now. It was just because <laughs> of the... Right. You know, the plastics, if universally your plastics are mostly still local unless you start talking about acrylics and uh, certain specialty plastics. Uh, a lot of your mass produced uh, uh, high end cosmetic plastics are coming from South Korea or coming from China uh, simply because, interestingly enough, the South Korean market has a demand where every company rebrand every single year. So they're always inventing new cool packaging. They're always inventing new cool stuff. And this has been accelerating over the last couple of years. And we're starting to see more of it in the United States because they've spent all this money on the tooling. And so it doesn't cost them that much more for them to just run this packaging again. So we're seeing a lot of that spill over into the United States with lower minimum orders. But for the most part, your your HDPE bottles are going to be fairly local. They're you can almost assure that they're going to be uh, made in the United States. Your PET bottles are mostly going to be local. Your your glass is all coming from China, though. I mean, there just are not any glass plants in the United States anymore. And you know, again, were the industry to demand something like that, someone would probably step up and fill that void. But the which demand is how, have to be have high enough. Which is really how, you know, large orders really dictate the market in that way, you know. Right. You really sort of, you know, unless, and, and again, usually something like, you know, that's going to be, you know, more durable and reusable is going to have a much higher cost. And then exactly. people who will want to order in quantity, you know, that are going to dictate it are usually going to be concerned with, you know, <clears throat> the, the cost of doing so. Uh, so, you know, I can definitely understand how and why they go the more disposable route and especially with regulations changing a lot too, because you, know, well, there's, you, you wouldn't want to spend a whole bunch of money, uh, you know, in this case, four times as much money or five times as much money, just, you know, sort of throwing numbers out there, but, uh, right. a lot more money, I would say significantly more like that one bag you showed compared to the cost of this one glass jar. It's probably pretty significant, you know, I would say at least five times as much probably, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Even, even buying in bulk, you know, when the price goes down, buying bulk on either one of them, there's going to drop and it's still going to be about five times as much. So, 
Uh, Absolutely. And that's where your local packaging distributor is really fits in for a lot of people is that people are, especially with our or generation, more people are searching out the internet first and they're, they're moving to the internet to look at a catalog and to order, but they're not hitting on their local packaging distributor who is buying local, who can group a people together to get something unique. Say you work with another, a different local company, maybe they're not producing the exact same product you are, but maybe you hear about a, a sauce from your local co-packer, maybe you can combine with them and get a big enough order to get some really special glass. That's where we really fill a need uh, within the community. And and that's where I would really encourage a lot of, most companies really to turn is find out who your local mom and pop or just you know local arm of a, a packaging distributor. Go and work with them because you'll, you'll get better, I mean, you know, I won't say you'll universally get better service, but you you know you know what I'm saying. Yeah, you you, I think you got a lot better chance of getting better service anyway, for sure. Not that you can't get good service from an online place, but it's I feel like it is more difficult, and the odds are less that you will. Um, and uh, and and resolving issues is probably like a big part of that. I think that if you know it's difficult to resolve issues once you know everybody's gotten through to a certain point and spend money and a bunch of stuff has been shipped and then. You don't find out the mistake happens until a long way down and then now you got to ship stuff back and you know so uh some of the some of the advantages of working with just another human locally is being able to catch some of that stuff a little bit more early on or better absorb those costs because you know them being more of a hub you know maybe they can set that order there and and sell it off more over time and be able to better absorb the cost for the, the customer um, and I, I see that happen a lot with like uh <clears throat> like uh car parts like wrecking yards like for old car parts and stuff my uncle's always looking for old car parts and jeep parts and all kinds of stuff and some of them are really difficult to find but one of the things that's cool about uh like auto wreckers is uh you know they figured out a long time ago that if they network together they can all make yep. a little bit of money all the time instead of you know hoarding on to stuff and hoping that somebody stumbles upon a, a rare part that you've just been sitting on for maybe years. Network so, sharing parts, right? You're yeah. talking about network sharing. Yeah. You go in there to go, we don't have it, but let me look on the you know computer real quick. Oh yeah, my buddy up in Columbia's got it. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, they can they can absorb those kind of things too. So if you like uh, just recently I shipped a a back seat for a, a car all the way over here and was gonna pick it up for him and when it came in he was like, Oh no, this I can't, I can't tell you this. This thing is just wrecked. It's disgusting. It's dirty. It's got big tears in the seat. Like it's not at all what, what they pictured. So I can't sell it to you. I ordered another one. It's going to be here in a couple of days. And that's the kind of stuff. It didn't cost me anything. He's got to, you know, basically eat the cost of shipping that seat. But as a consumer, you know, he can set that there and, you know, maybe try and make use of it or do something different. But that's the kind of stuff I feel like you get with local stuff that you're not going to get with like an Amazon order or something like that you know what i mean absolutely and uh, that's actually an issue i've been dealing with over the last couple of days is that i have a customer that needs some emergency packaging and they're going to be out of their their packaging and because we have a large warehouse i'm able to walk down to the warehouse i'm able to grab a couple of of cases of lids and i can get them out of a jam simply because we, we deal in that lid all the time. Because all, pretty much all of your lids are, are stock sizes anyway, unless it's yeah. something, yeah, I mean, ev everything is the same, the same, the same, the same. Uh, <laughs> it's really just how you put all of the different Lego pieces together that really make something really creative and unique. And that's, and that's also something where I feel like we're doing really well because we've partnered with a lot of local decorators. We have a lot of local connections with co-packers. So people are calling us up saying, I need a bottle for an energy drink. And we're able to call to our co-packer and say, do you have time to, you know, to meet with us and talk to us about, you know, what's the best way to go about filling the bottle and, and talk through everything. And we, all kind of work together and we keep making some really cool stuff for people that otherwise wouldn't be able to to afford it if they were going through a larger company and the minimum orders would just be way out of reach for a lot of people cool 
when you were talking about the hunt and being able to get them to adapt something and you were saying it'd take 150,000, I never got to get this out, but isn't that basically a truckload? Yep. That's yep. correct. You got a truckload to get anything done. That's right. <laughs> yep. I mean, and it really depends. You know, I mean, a truckload for some things could be a couple million. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you get a you get a container of uh, of all these pop top containers from uh, from China, and you're looking at two three million crammed in a 40, 40 foot container. Yeah, but they're much lower cost per per unit. No? Depen- it you've got to factor in the freight. Um, oh, so. Well, yeah. It's so landed cost is is a funny beast when you really start talking about freight your flexible packaging is really the most uh, is the the most cost effective thing that you can you can be working with because they, they hate shipping empty containers full of air right, right. Well, they won't. They you're, won't. You're, no literally you will yep. save money by throwing cinder blocks in the bottom of it we I've, I've done it on pallet <laughs> orders where I literally it was it made sense for me to buy it was cheaper for the customer to pay for like four or five cinder blocks to weigh down their order than it was to to not put those cinder blocks in it was ridiculous <laughs> it is the bane of my existence it is something I fight with every day it's gotten really bad the last few years because we used to be able to get the friend i'll tell you the biggest thing that kills me we oh, oh, i mean that brings it to, to the head and it, it doesn't matter what product it is but i've been trying to, i wanted to a few years ago i decided i had the money i was going to buy I've been wanting a bunch of uh nice seven flow trays mm-hmm. you know and i was going to buy the professional trays with the right plastic and all and i could the shipping was more than a damn tray Yep. You couldn't even buy. You can't even buy the tray. You got to have a local source to go buy. So you got to get in the car and go buy that tray. And the tray might be sixty-five bucks, but to get it shipped, by the time you get it shipped, it's one hundred fifty bucks. So yep. yeah, shipping has gone ape shit since the you know the the gas glut of a few years ago. The funny thing is, is the cost of shipping didn't come down when the gas came down the last two or three years. You notice that? Right. They, they didn't. You know, like they started really getting bad on shipping, right? About what uh, eight eight years ago? I don't know how long you've been doing this, but what you're laughing at? Uh, no, I'm laughing because we veered off into you know Noam Chomsky neoliberalism land and uh, <laughs> oh sorry from packaging. Oh, we get off <laughs> we get off topic all the time. It's fine. We're, we're discussing that part of the cost of it is shipping, so we really we're kind of no no no. I'm just laughing because we we gripe about no. You're you're absolutely correct. We gripe about that all the time because our fuel costs have continued to go up and go up and go up, and the labor cost goes up and up and up on it. And the it depends on shipping lanes and with the uh, infrastructure crumbling, bridge closures, anything that happens. You know, if it's a uh, rain. Uh, heavy rains, your your freight cost just keeps going up and up and up. And that's the cost of these goods. It's driving the cost of these goods way, way up when you really get them too far away. All right. And that, you know, one of the things that we talk about in terms of packaging too, in driving up costs and uh, I guess ultimately in the end for patients, you know, maybe it's, it's good for somebody in the packaging industry, but when they put uh, the limitations on medicinal edibles specifically, uh, you know, I, I felt like that was a pretty fucked up thing to do to cancer patients because, you know, if you're only allowed to have 10 milligrams of medicine per package and now you want to, you know, you need to consume 100 milligrams, you now you have to buy 10 times as much packaging as you did before, right? I mean, there's yeah. that's really... There's no other way around that. Like if I'm coming to you to buy 10 packages and I have to divide them up individually, that's still going to cost me 10 times as much, right? I mean, ultimately, there's really no way around that, right? Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. And there's, uh, it's something that we're really working hard to figure out because, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the bad guy that you're coming back to going, I just had to throw out $15,000 worth of stuff that I just bought. 
mm-hmm. you know, what the fuck, you know, I want to work with people. So one of the things that we really are bracing people for is we're going to need to look at multiple layers of packaging. There's going to need to be inner packaging. There's going to need to be outer packaging. We're going to have to determine where's the CRC, where are the regulations, you know, where are the blank panels that it's going to be, you know, is it going to be Did opaque really, on the inside? Is it going to be what CRC is for people? Oh, child resistant closure. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, there is actually a, um, a governmental regulation on what consists of uh, uh, child resistant closure and it has to go through a certain amount of testing. Um, I am not as familiar with that at the moment as I should be, but uh, uh, suffice it to say that uh, we, uh, you, you're push and turn caps your uh, squee- pop tops. Uh, some of the coolest package we've been seeing has actually been in cardboard where they figured out how to fold a box so that you have to push tabs and pull strips that makes the, the packaging child resistant and senior friendly because they're making it out of a certain weight of, of chipboard that doesn't tear as easily. So when you try and pull the packaging apart, uh, it requires much more force than a child sh- should be able to exert to open it. And I don't know what that amount is, but uh, yeah, you know, I guess I, well, I understand that and yeah. people's concern about protecting kids and all of that stuff. Like, you know, unless it's like a whiskey bottle or, you know, something like that. Right. You know, right. then they don't give a shit, but, or a wine, you know, well, whoops, I knocked the cork off that mom left. Open, but anyway, <laughs> Back to the that, you know, I, I, I yeah. still think that it, you know, probably, and I don't, I don't want to like imply that that any of those decisions about edibles had anything to do with packaging companies. Like I'm sure they weren't like leveraging for it, but have you guys community or, or looked into, I'm sure you guys are trying to stay up on regulations all the time. Uh, but is there any way that you guys have to provide feedback around like, what the results are of some of these decisions that I feel like people make that, you know, may not get feedback from other places. I mean, really a packaging company is probably the best place that, a you know, a response like that could come from like, Hey, this is going to cost people 10 times as much money in packaging materials. You know, that's probably not the best thing to do to a cancer patient, you know, or maybe somebody with arth- arthritis can't open, uh, you know, the package because they can't exert the same force that a child can either. Like, you know, I've never so thought about it. That that's 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 yeah. I mean, literally, you could be one of the biggest advocates we have for fighting some of these regulations. I mean, it's, it's weird. It's weird to think about. But I'm just wondering if you right now, if if you guys have had, if you just have a way of doing it, not if you are or like anything like that, but just you know, is there any like mechanic for that? I guess we I mean, we do have contacts in the industry, but. Uh, it's something I'll, we'll have to look into and, and work towards. I, I think you're absolutely correct that, that uh, we could really be an asset to the movement. But at the moment, like, the industry is so conservative for them to sort of give tacit approval for there to be a marijuana division and for them to openly <laughs> advertise a marijuana division. It's, it's a big stretch for them right now. That's just the reality of a lot of these industries. You're um, not saying stigma is holding back the cannabis industry, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that at all. Why does uh, it have to have a label at all, though? Why can't it just uh, be another company buying packaging? Well, because it's a specific industry. Well, I'll yeah. let him speak to it. Does it. Do you have specific regulations and things you have to cater to? Yeah. Well, that's true. That's true. But they do that for the other industries. So it's not. that's still not any different either. It oh, should just be treated as a company needing a package. Whatever the specifications you're willing to do, those specifications. So I understand what you're saying. The corporate doesn't uh, isn't ready to get on board with this. Corporate isn't really ready to throw their weight around in the legislative process on it. I right. would say, um, right. and well, that's, a good that's point. just that's the unfortunate yeah. aspect of it. They're willing to, I mean, you know, everybody has to say it, but they're willing to make the money off of the industry, but they're not willing to fight for it to exist <laughs> because. <it's, laughs> Out of my mouth and I want to make the money, but not fight for it. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, because at the moment, let's face it, the industry, despite how large and how <laughs> rapidly it's growing, 
doesn't compete with some of our nutraceutical clients who are ordering truckloads of plastic every month. They're ordering two and three truckloads. You know, right. the, it doesn't compete with the beer industry where we're shipping, uh, you know, pallets and pallets of yeah. glass. And beer doesn't want marijuana legalized, I guarantee you. Right. That's, <laughs> and, you know, um, you don't have and to the, comment on that, Jeremy. <laughs> we, and we, the package, I mean, you know, thank the, you, Jeremy. The, we don't want you to get fired. I'm not going to get fired. No, 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 no. Um, it's a, but you know, the, the, uh, <laughs> we're just in an unfortunate position where, you know, everybody's just willing to just take the money. That's right. right and, that's right. Uh, and, and not that there's really, you know, obviously you guys have little control over what the, the legislation <laughs> is and if it goes in your favor, then obviously it's great. But I, I do think it, like I was saying, it would be cool if there was just somewhere, where you guys could provide some sort of feedback or somebody responsible for asking like, Hey, what, you know, cause it seems like the right person to ask if you're concerned about what kind of cost that's going to, you know, pass on to the end user in this case, um, you know, who better to ask than the packaging company. And, uh, yeah. so it, it would be a good place to have that. And it's just one of many things that it, like, you, you know, in the industry that are held back because of stigma or, Overregulation or improper regulation, um, you know, it's you know, add it to the list, right? But well, and the uh, other aspect of it is that um, the most of the industry is still a cash industry, and when you're trying to do large plastic orders or you're trying to do large material orders in any any way, you we're looking for credit applications. You know, we're we're placing you know a forty thousand dollar order or a eighty thousand dollar order based on blind faith or, you know, you bring in $80,000 in cash to the office. And that, that's been a big problem as well. That's why, I mean, it's again, where the local distributor can be very, very helpful because if we have something locally, if we're stocking something, if we're ordering the pallets of things, we can help you by rolling with the punches as the regula as the regulations change, we can help absorb the cost because we're absorbing it across many different companies. And as long as we find something that is universally agreeable or in, in ways that we can dress up for each individual company, then you know, then we'll be able to really help each other to to find better packaging for the business to really succeed. Not only that, I remember that most cannabis industries operate on cash. Yep. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, can you walk in? So no, resources are as simple as just like having a safe big enough to put the cash in and, and have it secure, right? I mean, right. there's not a lot of businesses that are equipped to receive $80,000 in cash. Uh, you know, that's just the logistics of it. So just having that one resource, uh, you know, sure. can be valuable because as like even as somebody who's operated a home business for over a decade, I can tell you one of my customers wanted to pay me in cash. I would be a little bit concerned about, you know, A, them driving around with $80,000 in cash and me having $80,000 in cash and having to drive it to the bank afterwards. So, uh, you know, that was just one of those things. It's a resource that uh, somebody local can have in place, ready to go, already paid for, have to reinvent the wheel and everybody can sort of make use out of it is kind of, I think what you guys are trying to do for the most part and point out those things. So. Well, exactly. We're trying to find a way to be a local resource so that you can order in lower volumes because you're ordering with groups. My, um, a good example, I have a lot of different juice customers where we order pallets of bottles to get them closer to truckload pricing so that they can come and they can draw off of those pallets, you know, every couple of weeks. We order huge truckloads of glass into uh, uh, for the local uh, iced coffee places, cold brew coffee. We have kombucha customers. We have, like I said, sauces. Uh, Hank Sauce is a really big customer. So we're ordering in a lot of different glass to, to be able to, to help a lot of different people get a better price on their their packaging they're saving they end up saving on freight and they end up saving on just the manufacturing cost itself by ordering in bulk right well, that's and pretty awesome, I mean, but talk about not awesome. reinventing the wheel ordering in bulk yeah. and all yeah. that you know that's almost like being a co-op like let's yeah. you know 
it's almost like you're operating almost as a co-op for them because you recognize the local needs. And that is pretty cool as a company. Not oh, many cool. companies do that order a truckload so that I can like, if I could get my, I wish I could get my feed and seed guy over here to order me a pallet of things, you know, so I could go and buy a bag every once in a while, but he's not going for it. You know? Right. I, well, I mean, you know, we, we won't do it for just any customer. You know, we would need enough demand for us to be yeah, able to yeah. order a whole truckload. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we, we, we have to get paid for our effort too. Um, but, yeah. you know, but the, but the trick is that, you know, we, we're trying to help you out as well because we feel like, especially in our office, that if your company is growing, we're growing as well. And that's, we want to be in that sweet spot of really helping people as they're coming out of their home office, uh, coming out of their, their garage with their great products and moving into, into more mass production but not quite mass production, not ready to buy their own equipment. Using cold packing and stuff like that. Well, we have, we have local co-packers that we work with that are really great. Uh, a &L Packaging is one of our local co-packers, and they are one of the only local people that will do aerosols. So we do really cool airless products with them uh, where there's, there's some really cool engineering technology <clears throat> Excuse me, that's happening um, in the cosmetic industry with airless products where the atmosphere that is in the package is that atmosphere forever. It, it either pulls a vacuum as you remove product or there's an internal exchange of air to maintain that same atmosphere. So if you have a powdered product and you need it to say aerosol in any way, you uh, can, when you package it, you could pump it full of, of, you know, some sort of stabilizing air or whatever, or suck all of the air out, make it a complete vacuum. And then as you pull the trigger, it's uh, picking drawing up, the, it it's dip. drawing it up the dipstick and then going through a one-way valve. And this is some really cool engin uh, mechanical engineering that's happening right now. And it's, intended for the cosmetics industry but it has thousands of different applications across the the cannabis field you know if you're thinking about your uh your ipm treatment what if you have a powdered ipm that you need to spray like diatomaceous earth if you're trying to apply that onto a, a topsoil you you could use some sort of a dipstick that wouldn't your mm. your powder wouldn't end up clumping uh, right right that's funny you bring that up. I'm a big proponent of that. Not not aquaponics. They, I don't think they like it too much. But in soil, <laughs> yeah, in soil, in hydroponics, or to get rid of spider mites and stuff. That shit is gold, and you can eat it and get rid of all your parasites too. If you feed it to your pets, it rids hmm. your body. Of, I love diatomaceous earth. It's a miracle. It's got every mineral on the planet in it too. But you're right. I, I love it that you brought that up. I'm, I'm sold. I want some. I want to buy some. Yeah. <laughs> well, you still spread some of the cans. You're earth. I want to package that. Yes. You still yeah, spread yeah. on your flowers because you don't want to smoke it. That's not right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very bad for your lungs if you smoke it. Right. Right. You don't. But, you don't want to spray flowers. But you know, by working with your local company, I get to see cool stuff like this because I get everybody's magazine and, and I get to see all of the different Korean products because this is actually a Korean product where they're rebranding every single year. It's a humid climate and they need to spray a, a base powder on the face and they, and they want it to apply cleanly every single time. So the wow. dipstick even twists so it doesn't clump in the bottom. Then they've got uh, other airless packages for lotions because again, because it's so humid, you end up changing the water content within the, uh, the lotion itself. So they've developed all of these valved packages that pull vacuum. So you're always pulling the product out of the, out of the packaging. Now with that engineering and because of the freight coming from Korea, it's really expensive stuff, but of course. Cool. if you've got a margin for it, like a lot of uh, like a lot of cannabis products do, you can get some really high end, really interesting products at fairly low MOQs. But Is it's great. To like uh, like doing elaborate things for flour, for instance, since it has you know a couple of different requirements, you know. Depending on what you want to do, a lot of people don't want it, you know, to be exposed to light, right? You know, or you know, 
you know, it, it's a little bit similar to cigars, I guess, in a couple of ways and that you want, you know, sort of a constant humidity if you can. And, you know, so do you have any, anything like that, that, uh, for flower in particular? That is really, you know, the, the sky's the limit with a lot of these options because what, what would you like to package it in? You know, a lot of people don't want to package it in plastic. They're not going to want to package it in PET or polypropylene or something like that. Every, you know, some people are looking for glass. Uh, you know, you can take, you know, just a regular jar and stick a CRC cap on it. And this is just like a spice jar. It could be just it, really anything with it. I always like to ask people, what's your, what do you imagine that you, uh, that you'd like your flower to look like? You know, what do you, how do you want it to be presented to the customer? What do you imagine that, that it's going to look the best to them? Because it's wide open. The world is wide open to your creativity. You could go into flexible packaging if you're trying to save money. Um, and there's a whole world of options with custom printing options and uh, hot stamping, foils, layers, windows cut into them, uh, opaque patterns. Uh, easier can, to ship. Yeah, easier to ship. Easier you can to get ship. That. That's the thing, I think. It's the biggest thing is flat. Yeah. And not only I'm that. But if you're comparing it to a rigid container, you can even spend a little bit more and buy an American product, uh, American flexible packaging, save on your freight, buy it in the United States. Um, you'll save on your landed cost in the end, but you won't save as much money as if you buy from China. I will, I mean, I will say that. Like, the, the <coughs> producing flexible at such a tremendous rate in such tremendous volumes, there's no way that American companies can compete. If I call up a flexible manufacturer and I tell them that I got a quote from a Chinese company, they hang up on me. They won't, they just won't talk to me anymore um, because they're getting beat up left and right. Um, so really to get back to that, sort of like LED, you know, in electronics, you know, a lot of that stuff, even, even a lot of the, <clears throat> You know, companies that we've had on that are based in the United States in terms of where their companies are, they're still right. not. Uh, uh, a lot of the parts are still made over there just because they can produce them so much cheaper. Well, what I would really love to see is I would love to see the growers community really band together and try to pressure their Congress critters into drafting legislation that emphasizes purchasing American made goods for their packaging because it's possible. And if we do enough of it and we really band together, we can get that manufacturing cost low enough to compete with importing Chinese goods. So, like, I mean, to really come back to a lot of what you were saying about, it's the same with, with uh, PCR and with recycled plastics. Re uh, we could really demand that within our local laws and our local legislation. We could really, you could connect with your local dis packaging distributor and tell them, hey, we need American-made pop tops. We want American-made flexible. We want it to contain this much recycled plastic do not ask for recycled glass <laughs> there is no way to guarantee that what was originally in the glass was non-toxic so when they go through the recycling plastic or the recycle process for recycling glass there's i no you don't want to put anything that you're going to put in your body into recycled glass unless you do the recycling yourself so. Plus, I mean, glass is pretty cheap and easy to make, and there's plenty of sand in the world, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yay! Oh. <laughs> so, what are some of the more funkier packaging? You showed me some funky syringes and some of these other cool, oh, like, yeah. like, do you got any other uh, you want to talk about or show any of the other funkier? You got some cool stuff. Uh, all of my cool stuff is at the office. So yeah, like I was saying, we've really been hitting on lately. Uh, we, uh, it's funny how the packaging world works. It's such a small world. Like my boss is third generation packaging the company. Uh, and, and he'll tell my boss, I'll tell you his grandfather got into packaging, selling glass bottles to moonshiners. Um, so 
the company yeah. itself has been in business for 85 years and we've been working with all of the same salesmen, all the same vendors, all the same other distributors, all the same competitors. So when we see marijuanapackaging.com, when we see Kush bottles, when we see Canaline, when we see e-bottles, we know all these guys. So as this, the whole industry sort of moves, one of the salesmen recently shifted to a company and he's been working for several different South Korean firms. And we've been getting all of this really cool South Korean packaging magazines and it's neat stuff. It's like I said, it's fairly expensive. It's highly cosmetic. Uh, a lot of it has to do with airless, uh, different types of auto loading droppers, possibilities for patients, uh, especially uh, with child resistant uh, tinctures or, or, or when you're dealing with tincture products and you need a child resistant package, there are auto loading droppers now where you screw the, the dropper into the top of the bottle. It draws up a certain uh, measured amount of product into the dropper. You unscrew the top. There's a valve closure on the top of it so you can turn it over and nothing will pour out. And you have a loaded dropper where you just plunge it and you have a measured dose of something. That's cool. That's Huge cool. applications within the, the cannabis industry. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's some really cool atomizers that are on the market where uh, we can fit little trigger sprayers or little pump sprayers onto some really neat bottles, either glass, um, maybe PET. I don't know. It, it, it really depends on what your product base is. Uh, and the type of oil as to uh, what type of plastic we recommend. So. Cool. Yeah. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah, you don't think so. You probably come about it all the time, but, you know. No, no, I love it. No, 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 no. I, I tell everybody I love my job. We come into work and we talk about packaging. We And especially because this is a new division for the company, we're all really excited about it and really excited about the customers that we're working with, especially Scotty at Real Growers. We're super excited about the work that we've been doing with him. We love his product. Uh, in fact, I got samples uh, brought into the office and my boss was screaming about his hibiscus showed me pictures he had never seen his hibiscus grow this way uh so he he's on board with with recharge it's 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 fun love my job and love coming to talk about packaging so yeah yeah he's been on the show three or four times we we often recommend recharge for people yeah it's yeah, good shit. Well, it's actually, I mean, I was, uh, that's actually how I found Scotty when I got into the, the packaging industry. I've been following the uh, Growing With Fishes podcast for a little over a year and learned about Recharge through you. And as soon as I got in the industry, I approached Scotty and said, can I help save you some money on your packaging? And he, he said, yes. <laughs> and we've been working at it ever since. And we're doing some really cool things for him. That's right. awesome. We bring people together. That's what we do here. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's so funny because they inspired us to do the show, and then we ended up for kicking back <laughs> his packaging guy. <laughs> you know, but you know what? We're all working together. Like I said, work with your local your local packaging distributor, or maybe you're not your local packaging distributor, but we'll figure it out. Well, uh, the other funny thing is, I work with the, some of the guys that do the bookings for some of their guests. The yeah. the, the the guys that help out. So. Uh, shout out to Malik Spider. Hell yeah! Thanks a lot for helping us out. Um, I've been I still gotta finish updating some of the stuff there, but uh, um, yeah, he helps out both shows, and he also helps out I think a little bit with the uh, the Grow Tube show. So shout out to him for for continued support for the whole the whole community, especially the podcast and live stream community is huge in uh, in helping us out for for making sure we can get cool guests on the show. Awesome. Yeah, it's um, so weird having the grow tube on on break. I know everybody freaked out. Thought it was a prank. Did you see that? <laughs> yeah, well no, hey, like we we've had a couple of times when we took off there was a time we think we took off two or three weeks from you and I were both just had a lot going on. It just happens sometimes, you know. Yeah, no, well they're you know, they did better than we did. They planned it and like announced it and everything. <clears throat> and then they, they did their last show before the break and uh and apparently a bunch of people didn't believe it and thought it was a prank and that they were like not really taking a break. It was all just a big joke. And they had to, he had to release the video like, no, really, we're not doing 
<laughs> he kept getting all these messages like you guys are doing a show tonight right like you know the uh, six o'clock or whatever it was they started at came rolling around and he had to put up a video on his youtube like no seriously it's not a joke we're not going to be on for like three weeks you guys need to find something else to do <laughs> <laughs> So that, that was pretty funny, but I love the grow too. And, uh, uh, it, it is a little weird not having them on, but it, it's, uh, I totally understand them wanting to take a break. I just thought it was funny that you had to put up a video for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, uh, we can get one or two of those guys over on our show while they're taking a break. I've been emailing, emailing a few of them. Yeah. I yeah. emailed crazy Diego. Um, <laughs> and, uh, somebody else, uh, asked uh posted on the thing actually i think it was malik it might have been that posted on my channel and <clears throat> said to email him so i messaged him a couple of times i talked to him on chat and they're you know they're always like oh yeah let's do it but the chat goes so fast i think you know they don't pay attention half the time other than just like you know general back and forth stuff so i haven't heard we'll, anything we'll get them on. it would be cool to get on there for sure oh very good so yeah, so what other? So I was pretty surprised. You, um, so you guys also offer some, um, like curing solutions and curing containers. I was kind of surprised to find that out. Do you want to talk about that? Well, yeah. So you know, I mean, really, everything's. Most people are curing glass, from what I, I mean, you know, from what I understand, from sort of the consensus, uh, and we can get access to some really big, like gallon two gallon, sometimes as much as five gallon glass uh, yeah. for a lot of customers. So if you need something with uh, a really good seal on it, again, talk to your local packaging distributor because again, this is this is a giant glass container. Yeah. You want it to come as from as close to your location as you possibly can to get the best price on it because your, your freight is going to suck on that thing. But yeah, we can get some, yeah, we can get some really cool, really big glass. All of it is really coming out of China. There's some neat stuff coming out of uh, uh, Shenzhen right now. Uh, I actually have an uncle that what he does is he translates for Chinese businesses and for Taiwanese businesses uh, when they're dealing with American companies that he helps facilitate business transactions. So we're starting to work with more glass manufacturers in China and seeing some neat stuff. We should be getting some some really cool vape cartridges in. Uh, I should be getting some really interesting display glass that uh, I'm going to show you, Steve. And uh, we're going to we're going to see some really neat stuff. So it's a, it's it's kind of fun. Yeah, I would imagine there's some cool stuff you could play. Like I mentioned, you know, we talked about the humidity stuff, and uh, and then also like you know UV protection, for instance. You know, a lot of people want to have. Yeah, right. um, you know, to not have the quality degrade over time and exposure to light, uh, but right. still be able to see through it, for instance, is one of the things that I hear a lot of people, um, they go into dispensaries, and I've seen a couple of them, uh, like on the higher, you know, the top shelf stuff, when I, I don't go into dispensaries very much, but when I do go in there, usually they have the, the top shelf stuff has fancy packaging um, of some sort, you know, I've seen everything from the, the small recyclable um, almost cardboard like containers where the top pulls off right or, like twists off um, and you can put your weed in there <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so um, and then obviously various glass containers uh, as well um, that come in there too but it's always interesting to see you know or wh what different stuff that people can do I think uh, canagars are interesting as well right you know, they're so similar to an actual cigar and there's already a whole industry around shipping fancy cigars around. So yeah, I mean, again, we're working <laughs> on with that with a Canagar company, and we've got. I found a glass manufacturer actually in New Jersey that makes scientific glass, and they make uh, actually cigar glass tubes. And it's there's there's so many different options, like from the PET preforms to uh, perhaps even uh, different types of beverage glass or what you would think of as spice glass like you you look at this and you think immediately spices but it could be something that you could package your product in uh, the the market is really wide open to your creativity as long as you're willing to decide where you're going to have crc 
where are you going to have you leave space for your your regulations to change um and you know how can you make it as universal as possible so it can either be opaque or it can be clear you know so if you're taking like for instance if you're taking this pet preform what well, it since this is a standard closure on top of here it's a standard size neck i can get a child resistant cap that's a push and turn that will fit onto here exactly i can get a liner put in here that'll put a that, that pressure sensitive liner so we could do sealed for our protection across the top of it and it'll be an ugly plastic standard child resistant closure but it will fulfill your regulations and then we can get we could take that and then we can dip it in wax or we can do all sorts of things we could do a shriek shrink band we can like we i've done here where we've done uh, worked with a local decorator and we've done a really cool digital transfer that we're uh, working with really low minimums and we're really excited about. Um, uh, That's cool. Make a small plug for our, for our customer, but we're doing some really cool stuff. It's to be able to, but specifically to be able to help this industry since everybody has to order in one, two cases. You know, you're not rolling into your local packaging distributor and dropping four or five grand on your packaging. If you're ordering online using your own credit card, you're not ordering you know, 10, 15 grand, unless you are a fully invested uh, packing or, you know, a producer with, with deep pockets, with a you know, large capital. Most of those guys are coming in and they're looking for one, two cases. They're trying to buy, uh, you know, four or five things. So we're trying to find creative ways that we can get their package to stand out from everybody else's be unique, but in quantities you can afford instead of 25,000, 50,000. Right. Am I boring the shit out of everybody? No, no this no, is no, no. by chat. Chicken holes give me a hard time. <laughs> oh, there's our not buddy. over in chat. Does anybody have any questions in chat for uh, yeah. the packaging expert? <laughs> do you guys have any, uh, what other, do you guys have any other uh, stuff you offer? Maybe like large, large containers or people you know that are maybe storing cured bud or, or in, you know oh, in large God. batches or some other oh, stuff. Like that. Oh, absolutely. There's the like I said the the world is really your oyster right now because we're really inventing the packaging world and we can find a lot of creative options between you know five gallon buckets that we can get made locally or you know uh, large glass options. There are. Uh, large maybe PET options or or flexible bag options that we can come up with for people uh, and again because we know all of these plastics manufacturers and we know them locally we can find ways to get them as near to you and as cheaply as we can we possibly can so. awesome yeah very cool <laughs> yeah um, so, pretty much in chat yet. Yeah, does anybody else yeah. in chat have any questions? We got 13 <laughs> people in chat, actually. Oh, really? I didn't yeah, know. we got 13 oh, people yeah. listening to how interesting, 14 people now <laughs> listening to how interesting the packaging is. Now so, he's nervous. Look out. Yeah. Now he's turning red. Most of them are just trying to peer pressure me into taking big hits, though, so. Yeah. <laughs> peer pressure. All right. What have you been up to, Steve? What's going on with you? Um, uh, so, uh, well, actually, before we do that, why don't you tell people how to find you there, Jeremy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If anybody wants to, uh, give me a call at the office, my, uh, phone number at the office is 410-242-8888, or, uh, you can send me an email at j.milner, that's M-I-L-N-E-R at andlerpackaging.com, A-N-D-L-E-R packaging.com. Yeah, but I put that in the description, so if anyone uh, needs that and wants to just copy and paste it and be lazy, you can do that as well. <laughs> but yeah, please give me a call if you know if you have any questions or you know if there. We really try to pride ourselves on being really honest with our customers about what we can and can't do for them. I'm often turning people away and saying, "Listen, you're not ordering a large enough volume. I'm you know here's your best option right now." here's how many you can order through me 
you know, come talk to us in a couple of months. Let me help you save money and let me help you grow to the level where I can help you. Or let, or can I, you know, get you caps or can I, you know, get you late, help you with your labels or something else. So there's a lot of options that I'm, I, we try to be really honest about where your dollars are being spent. What are you, you're being charged on freight and why? So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's excellent. I'll tell you what, I'll probably be calling you about a couple ideas I've had just to see where where I would stand and what I'd have to achieve to be able to get a good price break. So. Deal, I deal in a lot of stuff in North Carolina. Um, so. Oh, I had, yeah, I had one last we're question. We're pretty close. We're pretty close. Yeah, we're not okay. that far. I have one last question that I had. Um, what do you guys have for pa seed packaging? We have a lot of seed growers and g guys that do different genetics and stuff. What we've kind been, of packaging do you have available for seed distributors? We've been getting some really cool small flip top or just hinge top little packages that are, are similar to the standard little conical shape flip top, but they're, they're more cylindrical. They're more like the, uh, like your, your standard J tube pop top. Um, We've got those. We also have the little glass vials and like the one dram. Um, most people would look at them and think they're Coke vials, but we've got things like that. We have, uh, you know, Boston rounds. Really, the the world is your oyster when it comes to that. We could do, you know, even very small flexible bags. Yeah. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I was just, uh, I know we have a lot of different seed companies that listen, and I thought I'd, uh, um, you know, uh, it's one of the things that I definitely would be considering. Yeah, yeah. You're always looking for a new stealth way to ship. Yeah, uh -huh. we talked about the different, uh, you know, the different ones for consumption. We didn't talk about seeds or clones either. Clone shipping is another big thing that's come up. Yep. Actually, yeah. I get asked to ship clones all the time from random people that I don't know. It's fairly awkward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get that, the least uh, of seed requests a week. <laughs> but I do get uh, a lot of people that are, you know, that do legitimately want to do that, even, uh, you know, like interstate transfers and stuff like that, where it's, you know, like recreational grows that want to ex exchange uh, specific cuts to do grows, like experiments, side by sides, different growers growing the same cut. Right. It happens with breeders a lot. So clone shipping is another one. So. Um, you know, all that is, you know, just different fingers of that industry that you could explore. And, you know, like you said, you know, how many do you want to ship at a time? Do you want a tray? Do you want, you know, like all of those things end up coming up, you know, each, each their own little rabbit holes. Well, I'm also a 3D designer and 3D modeler uh, for our office too. So I do uh, help people with tooling and doing custom tooling. I've done a couple of custom bottle projects around the office um, and then do some interesting projects for myself. So that's another thing that we can really help people with as they you know, are trying to find something new and interesting and we're developing new aspects. Like, you know, how would you, how would you like to ship a clone? You know, what it, it, what are your requirements? It'd have to be crush proof. It would have to be, uh, I don't know. It'd have to be leak proof, Perfect. right? It'd have to be watertight. watertight. Yeah. Would you, would you have one or two chambers? Uh, what materials do you want it to not be made out of? You know, you wouldn't want it to be made out of glass necessarily. Do you want it to be made out of acrylic? Um, that acrylic is probably going to come from China, so you're going to need to get a bill of materials for it. Like it's, it's the things start getting really complex when we talk about it, but it's it's really fun. It's really um, so. But uh, yeah, while we can explore that industry and and we can talk about that, that's something that's really going to be uh, more moving forward as legalization moves forward across the country because right now if you were to dump a bunch of money into developing a, a product to uh ship clones across state lines i can guarantee you would you'd have that that plastic product seized coming into the united states right and i think that you know again with more more stigma and regulation and all of the stuff that holds back the cannabis, cannabis industry you might not see a lot of this stuff for a number of years yeah it's interesting i think to think about different stuff and i think you know, even uh, even shipping uh, mass amounts that so you talked about, you know, five gallons of glass, you know, a glass container that holds five gallons is a very large glass container. But in a, yeah. a lot of cases, if you're going to eventually like, let's say I'm a producer in Oregon and uh, I want to sell um, my excess cannabis to somebody in, uh, say, Las Vegas, 
who has, you know, maybe not the ability to meet the demand that they'll get because of their tourism and the right. fact that they live in a desert and the definition of a desert is nothing grows there. <laughs> so, um, if I want to ship hundreds of pounds down there, uh, you know, that's going to, you know, bring up a whole nother set of logistical challenges and shipping. Um, you know, people have been fighting that battle for a long time. <laughs> right. Um, so I, to do that on a commercial level, I think will be interesting to see how that plays out once state lines do open up or even international lines do open up, you know, sometime in the far, far future, probably. Right. But, uh, it will be interesting to watch for sure. Well, you know, and that's one of the things where, you know, there's, I can be sort of the sweet spot or I can point you in the right direction because I feel like for companies that are looking to create dispensaries and they're looking for display glass and even in some cases curing glass, I'm sorry, Steve, I'm going to cut myself out of some business here, but uh, I think that you're, it's more in your best interest to look at your local glass blowers at your local, like, you know, for like Scotty, for like say mountainside glass or somebody of, of that nature. Um, uh, if you could find a local producer of beautiful decorative glass, you're probably, you're going to spend more money, but you might end up spending less than getting a really big jar from some, from China, unless you're buying a lot of them. You know, if you're buying five or six for your dispensary, you know, Harbor Freight, maybe your store. So just give people an idea, what, what size jar is this glass here? Do you know what, how many gallons this is? Is this a half gallon? I think that's, yeah, that looks like a 64 ounce. So it looks like half gallon. Yeah, pretty sure. So the, the, it's 10 times bigger than this then, basically, right? That right. five gallon glass container we're talking about. Yeah. So and, just to give yeah. people a size reference. And then when we ship it, you know, and, and that size glass container, my cost might be somewhere in the area from three to four dollars for that container before landed cost before we we have it shipped in and then when you ship in a pallet of them a pallet might only be 50 of them so it costs you know four hundred dollars for that one pallet divided by 50 little glass containers that three dollar container just jumped up to you know what ten <laughs> Right. You might be better off going to Harbor Freight. You might be better going off to Pier One. Um, you know, I make sure that your glass is, of course, food safe. But right. if you know, if you're looking for big display glass, something that's that's more decorative rather than what you're using for your product, that might be a better fit. For sure. Hmm. Any questions at all? Or did everybody fall asleep? No, Steve's typing away. I can see him. He's talking to somebody. <laughs> you muted, Steve? Just working chat. That's all. Oh. Uh, <laughs> saying hi to people in chat. E ECSD says hi. What have you been up to, Roger? Oh, what am I up to? I've been uh, trying to keep up lately. I've had, I had some, you know, some uh, network failures a, a month ago and I'm still catching up from that but forums running pretty good uh, we did the blogs running great uh, wow well, we got a ton of people using those flower powered fertilizer it's it's just crazy uh, I'm, I'm really surprised how, how our membership of just everything we show them they just jump on it and uh, they're all having good success and people are very happy for them that's about all I'm doing I, I uh, that and take care of my dogs my 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 estranged wife is on the road, as usual. So uh, I'm here alone with the animals. So I'm 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 here babysitting and sleeping with the dogs. Yeah. All right. Nothing big. Nothing big. Roger, that is vicious. My clones. My clones are rooted. My 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 blue dream. My blueberry. My strawberry kush. My pineapple haze. They, the roots poked out the bottom of the rock well yesterday. Nice. Well, I was referring referring to your dogs. Yeah, you said what about my dogs? No, no I said Roger and his bitches. Referring <laughs> to your dogs. I actually have uh, actually I have two bitches and one male, one big giant hound dog. I know. I remember you saying you had a couple of girl dogs. Yeah, well, yeah. Four, I got two, two, almost two, almost five, and then an ancient female uh, golden retriever. 
hound dog and a ba and a two year old female pit bull. That's crazy. Red nose. Hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully Brain Grow comes back. He uh, we haven't seen him in a little bit. Yeah, I'll check and uh, I'll look at the forum because I can. The thing about it is, him being a member of the forum and helping out, I could private message him at the forum. Well, I haven't uh, seen him on Facebook. Well, I have a couple other means of talking to him, and I haven't seen him around. He's just been busy, I guess. Yeah. Um, what's new with you, Marty? Uh, let's see. I'm about 99% sure my side-by-side -side that was supposed to be two of the same cut is not two of the same cut. Um, <laughs> so somebody got high. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not really sure what happened there, but the – uh, the guy that I got uh, that whole batch from uh, that I had grown up and then previously, you know, taken cuts of those. So um, who had them originally and flowered them before he should be able to give me an idea of which one it is. But it should be some, you know, either way, it's all, you know, good stuff. It's either like Starfighter, uh, OG or Grogu number four or Jaeger or you know, there's no really bad options. Uh, except for the only real issue is that it's supposed to be for a side-by-side -side grow. Um, and, you know, to test, they're supposed to be the same cut of the same strain in order for that to really, like, you know, matter, I guess. So, uh, and it's all grown up into the net and everything. So, I, you know, I probably have to, like, just about cut it out at this point in order to really do anything about it. And uh, I wasn't really paying attention, you know. I, you know, I was away from the podcast for a few weeks my, when my daughter was born and wasn't really doing much in the garden or really doing anything else besides that. And uh, so <laughs> I finally got out, started making some videos and was training it to the net. And I started looking at it and I was like, oh shit, <laughs> this is not the same at all. And uh, so I'll have to decide what I want to do about that. If I want to just sort of restart and re -veg again, or if I'm just going to flower them out. Uh, so <laughs> that's been fun, but really just sort of, I guess, kind of rebooting the garden now that I, you know, the kid's getting a little bit older and sleeping through the night and a little bit less to do around the house. So, uh, so we got the house cleaned up and listed, you know, it's for sale. So that'll hopefully go through pretty soon and we can move on to this other property we've been looking at and I can actually start growing more than 10 plants again. Um, Good so, uh, you know, we've had a couple of people come look at it already. The neighbor's house sold in three days. So we're hoping it won't take forever. Uh, I don't expect it to be three days. Well, it's already been three days. So that didn't happen. But <clears throat> I wasn't expecting that anyway. But we are hoping that they'll be able to sell and we can sort of get all that stuff done. Uh, so other than that, just kind of rebooting uh, the, the grow in the garage and trying to figure out what I want to do with uh, – with that, making some ferments, it's a good time of year to ferment stuff. So, you know, I talked about the plum uh, tree out front. So, you know, it's fairly good size. So every time the kids get too rowdy indoors, I tell them to go outside and pick plums and we make another ferment. So it's always <clears throat> a good way to take advantage of child labor. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> everything's growing great with that. Uh, we made ferments and added it today. My son just uh, went out and uh, he loves to plant seeds. So his our big project today when he got rowdy was uh, we cracked open a big watermelon we bought from the farmer's market and he, he pulled out all the seeds and set them aside and then we went out and planted them out back. And so I have this, uh, you know, the raised beds that I used to grow medicine in, now I just grow food in, uh, which is, of course, perfectly fine with the county. Um, I can grow as much as I want of corn. <laughs> Um, I want to grow like one of those rotting flowers just so that it like smells ridiculously bad and it like blows right towards my asshole neighbor. But I know when you can get one, huh? there's a company called top tropicals. You yeah. can order them. They have a bunch of them right now. And, uh, I, I thought about ordering one, what are they? The corpse flowers. Yeah. The only problem is they take forever to flower. So it really would be sort of like. He'd probably be dead by the time it actually happens. So <laughs> take ten years. They take ten years to bloom, and they, you gotta keep them in a tropical environment. And they're like a huge bulb. Yeah, like if I could like guarantee that it would happen like this season, I would plant like an entire row of them along his <laughs> fence. Like that's yeah. That might hurt the sale of your house, though. I'll cut them down, compost them. It'll be fine. 
it's worth it. It's worth it. <laughs> no, so anyway, I have a, I have the bed set up out back, and uh, I have drip lines set up to where I can just, uh, you know, the, it just waters every day. And so when we plant seeds back there, what we figured out we can do is I just go through and uh, take the rake and sort of make a little trough underneath the drip line, and he goes in, and my son throws his watermelon seeds underneath there. And so we have like rows and rows of cantaloupe. And like, they're just like growing over the top of themselves at this point, just because it's like one of his favorite things to do is harvest his own seeds and, <clears throat> and plant them, uh, which he insists is just like Minecraft. And I keep telling him, no, Minecraft is just like the real world. But to a kid, it doesn't really make sense that way. It's the other way around. It's real life Minecraft. And I'm like, no, that's not it. <laughs> it's the other way around. That's but awesome, okay. though. Yeah, it's we have a lot of fun and it's it's great. It's a great way for him to sort of, you know, get outside and have some fun. And uh, he has some watermelons growing in aquaponic system. He planted those and uh, he's got like three or four watermelons on the vine now. So he's pretty excited to watch them grow. So it's fun to, you know, for them to get kind of that full picture of how all that stuff works. And, you know, he's only seven. So obviously just turned seven. So uh it's cool for him to sort of have that full experience and, and have that uh, exposure to just those sort of basic skills. And it, it's funny how he relates them to Minecraft, but really as long as he knows how to do it, who cares, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, but the fact he'll know how to grow food the rest of his life, that's for sure. Yeah, or where it comes from. Like, have you ever seen like a, I can't remember that guy's name that did this special where he went around to different schools and talked about their food programs and stuff. And he was like asking kids where stuff comes from. And like, nobody knew, like, you know, they thought milk came from plants or something like that. You know, all kinds of like, no, a, a bunch of kids had no idea like where food actually came from, like what right. was grown versus what was, you know, from animals or different stuff like that. And it was shocking, honestly. Oh, Jamie Oliver. I think that was the same. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he hated him at most of the schools, too, because it made them all look so bad for what they were feeding, feeding the kids. Most of the school districts. Yeah, they kicked him out of a couple of them. This was a few yeah. years ago. Uh, yeah, I think it's yeah. called Food Revolution or something like that. Anyway, you guys can look it up if you want to, but it's uh, it was pretty eye-opening for me just in terms of, like, you know, like you were saying, they basically, he made them look so bad, they basically kicked him out. They're like, no, we're done. <laughs> like, we can't have you come back in here anymore. And I was like, wow, that's, that's really sad. Yep. They can't handle the truth. All right. I, um, I can't talk about what I've been up to yet. I think another week or two and I'll finally be allowed to hopefully. Um, but, uh, a big you project. It's not little. Laying around your hotel room. That's. Yep. <laughs> Not much to talk about, Steve. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Can't you see the huge aquaponic grow behind me? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was talking about that with one of my friends the other day, though. Like, uh, like not having plants outside is like really getting on my nerves. Like, I've had them outside, uh, you know, every year for so long that like it just feels so fucking weird. It it like seems like you know, especially when you go out, you know, I'm a member of so many groups now that, uh, you know, everybody has their pictures of all their plants outside. And, you know, it's like, it's like you're sitting outside while everybody else is having fun. You know, like you're the sick kid inside looking out the window, everybody else playing. You're like, oh, that sucks. Me, uh, I can't grow my plants. <laughs> yeah, fuck the county. Me. <laughs> and take my medicine and go home. <laughs> oh, man. That sucks. And Marty's gone on and on about the uh, the uh, People's Republic of Oregon. Yeah, I call them the Jackson County Mafia. So the laws, the law until they change the law back and forth and back. I'm sure as soon as they see this, I'll get pulled over. <laughs> <laughs> so see, funny story, funny story. Actually, shout out oh, to right. there's a guy that that happens to work at the hotel uh, where I'm at, and he was walking. Well, I was walking by the other day, and he goes, "Oh shit, I'm listening to your podcast right now." And he showed me, and he was listening to our podcast. <laughs> and he goes, "I I, just, I stopped smoking, um, but I got some shit I'll give you." And he came back, and the next day he gave me a gas mask, like old school gas mask. It's fucking <laughs> awesome. And uh, he gave me a cool little pipe. 
I just want to say shout out. That was fucking dope as fuck. Oh, no, he says he's here. He's in chat. Yeah, there. He's in chat. So I thought that was dope. Shout out to TMA. I won't, I won't say the rest because I don't want to get him in trouble because I, I don't know if he's off air. I don't, I don't know if he's working or not. But I wanted to say shout out to him and thank you. Yeah, I see Old Fire Grows in chat too. Yeah, Old Fire Grows. Hell yeah. I'm going to be uh, spending some time with him. Him and I are going to be doing probably, probably well, yeah, him and I are going to at least do some, some uh, an Eclipse video together. We're going to drive up and see the Eclipse, I think, so that'll be pretty dope. Maybe maybe even do one with Marty. So we got some stuff in the works. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see if we can we, we can line it up. If not, we'll get you on the way back. All right, I may be in the middle of the woods, just so you know. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyways, that's uh, that weekend you're talking about going is the uh, uh, is the opening yeah. weekend of archery season, and I'm a big archery hunter, so uh, I will I will likely be somewhere in the middle of the woods at an undisclosed location. <coughs> but I will relay such location to you if you need to know. No, seriously though, I'll probably will not be around that weekend. Um, but I will be I may be up towards Central Oregon, so we could probably uh um rendezvous, we'll especially if you want to watch the eclipse, there's a, a lot of good places where you can apparently there's gonna be a lot of uh meteor showers as well. So yep. I always enjoy those. So we might be able to hook up. I don't know where I'll be. We'll find out. Where? Yeah, that'll be dope. But yeah, shout out to Old Fart Grows. We'll have him on the show again soon. He is uh, the Jedi Master of the uh, the extraction arts. Nice. So, mm. Yeah, people love those kind of shows. Yeah. We're going to get him on again. He's going to do a little... Uh, uh, like home small batch, like making medicine for your mom and dad, or you know, sick family member for yourself kind of thing. I was talking to him, so it's gonna be, be cool if uh, you know you could do something like we did with uh, Mountainside Glass. You know, that was such an elaborate. Uh, yeah, like, I can't believe like how in depth that guy was willing to go. It was really cool of him to take that kind of time and show us around and move around the shop cool. and. We'll, we'll have to do a video with Jeremy when he's actually in the warehouse so he can show us all the different crazy yeah. fucking things. Yeah, I actually have a, on that note, I have a really cool guest. I think it's next Sunday. I don't, I won't say who it is yet. And I, I, I can't remember if it's this Sunday or next Sunday. I'm pretty sure it's next Sunday. We have a really cool guest that is, uh, 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 really, really cool. And if you've ever read the, the, the book tie stick, You'll like this guest, so check it out. We got a really, really awesome guest lined up, but it might be we might do we do a random, uh, unannounced Sunday edition because of of when we're able to do an interview with this guy. Um, but it it'll be worth it. Trust me, you will not regret it. <laughs> so working on a pretty cool guest coming up. This is something that we've been work you've been working on like a few weeks. We've talked about. I've been working on this for a couple of months. I got I got two or three really dope guests that I've been working on. Where just a matter of timing and me getting they them and the technology they need to to make the the interview happen. And they don't live. And they don't live in the U.S. That's why we're doing uh, something. Uh, in, oh, okay, well, maybe they do. <laughs> I don't know where they live. <laughs> Here we go. So. Okay, so but let's yeah. quit talking about that. Yeah. No, 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 no. It'll be really cool, and it'll be. I'm trying to get on some some cooler um some cooler OGs, some people that that have grown cannabis for a long, long time, put up with some of the crazier bullshit uh, from back in the day, way before uh, it became legal, and allowed us to sit here and have a have a show and talk about it openly without worrying about having someone kicking our door in. <laughs> or at least not so much. You know, maybe worry a little less about having someone come kick your door in. So, yeah, <clears throat> or or be able to you know consume on air. Yeah. Legally. So without them, we wouldn't be able to do any of that. So I'm trying to get a couple of these guys on to do some interviews, um, and, and do some talks on 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 that. And you know, on that note, you, you guys can 
um, you know, take a couple of guesses on who we might be coming on the show. But I got a couple of the cool people lined up. So, and uh, what else? Is there anything I can talk about? Um, Did you want to talk about those bus in Yuba County? Oh yeah, you you go. You want to? Do you want to maybe introduce it? Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I maybe just I know more about it than you do. About it. I mean, I read as much as I could read about it um, earlier. There's a lot of different threads and stuff to read through, but there are basically uh, there have been at least a few different busts in Yuba County, um, some large ones. There was a weird like shooting that happened um, at this uh, the Rastafarian Church of Cannabis, which is uh, you know Eddie Lepp and I forget his wife's name now, but they've you know, he just got out of prison um, after serving, I think, seven and a half years of a 10-year sentence uh, for a nonviolent growing charge. Um, and uh, so there's this whole, like, conspiracy theory style video that's posted um, of people that work down there and of what happened and are alleging that it uh, that he got out early because he turned over a bunch of these grows uh, that he had talked with about maybe joining the church. And like, there's this whole, like, you can go watch the video. It's up. It's fairly long and elaborate. And they have a bunch of post-it notes on the wall. It looks like some like weird CSI set. And uh, I couldn't, I mean, of what I've read so far, I wouldn't like say there's anything that would be like considered evidence, but there's definitely seems like a pretty good divide of people that are like, yeah, this guy is a total scam artist, con artist, and people are like, no way, he'd never do that. You know, so it's pretty polarizing still. I mean, it just happened recently, but, uh, you know, a number of, you know, quote unquote, illegal grows. So, you know, they're not, wouldn't be considered like medical grows or anything else. I mean, one of them, I think was like 17,000 plants. Right, um, right. And, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Um, the the incident at the farm i think is kind of weird the guy shows up at the at the rastafarian place at the eddie Love place and they had to call the police he was like tearing plants out of the ground i guess <laughs> and they he told they told the police he was armed like they straight up were like yo this guy's got a gun make sure you come armed or make sure you have your vests and the cops didn't right. take it seriously and what happened both cops got shot yeah and they were they said you know that you know and there's a video that they posted about that incident, which was separate as well. Yep. Um, and so there's a lot of people that think all of that stuff is connected. And basically that he, I, if I understand again, it's a fairly long video <laughs> and it's not overly clear, uh, but it seems like right. what they're that's alleging, one side of it, you know, of course. Yeah. He's working with, you know, the DEA or whoever, that's how he got out of prison early, you know, even though he served, seven and a half years of a 10 year sentence. So, you know, you adjust for a good behavior and the fact that, you know, like he's this kind of old hippie dude, I can't imagine he got into much trouble. Um, you know, that seems fairly realistic. So I kind of see both sides of it. Like I can understand why people are on edge or nervous or develop theories around how different things can happen. But I haven't seen anything like evidence wise where I'm like, oh, wow, this is like totally a scam. But you definitely have people that seem to believe that. And, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not going to discredit anybody, but I do believe in innocent until proven guilty. So at this point, I haven't seen anything that was like damning evidence. Uh, but I, I do think that a lot of people are going to look more into it either way. So he'll be on the hot seat no matter what. The other thing I wanted to bring up, because it happened and it, they hadn't announced it yet by the time we went live last week, they, they passed the, um, I think it was Friday last week, they passed the uh, pr uh, legal protections for medical growers uh, on the federal level. It is still and will be for another two years illegal for the federal government to spend a single dime to go after legal medical cannabis growers. So, Yeah, that's cool. We talked about that a little bit last week because it had just happened. And, uh, oh, yeah, maybe we did. And uh, what, which is, <clears throat> I think, the most interesting part is that that was a Republican majority panel. You know, I, 
um, it was like, what, 16 out of 24 people on the panel were Republican and they still <laughs> like, they still voted to protect medical growers, which I think was pretty awesome. And two senators from New Jersey also in introduced a bill yesterday to have uh, cannabis removed from the Class A narcotics. Yeah, uh, Cory Booker. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. A number, of, a number of stuff. We should do like that's a pretty elaborate program, actually. Well, Jeremy, I understand you're getting ready to take off. We all appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I actually have. Don't you to fall asleep on air? I'd be embarrassed. Yeah. yeah, he's he's one of them East Coasters. Yeah, yeah. Hey, East Coast, East Coast. That's where I grew up. It's fine. I know. That's right. You're, you're just far as East. Oh, yeah, the same area code as the I did growing up, which is uh, yep. crazy. Yeah, yeah. Love Philadelphia. Spent nine years there. Wish I was still living there. So good anyway. ass. They're some of the best food. Oh my god. Oh, oh. There's no. I I think it's one of the best cities to eat in in the United States. It's just great. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, thanks for all the great information, Jeremy. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I'm turning you. into a pumpkin, but uh, it, have, oh, you know, have yeah. I, it's that pumpkin time for all of us. I think. I think so. <laughs> hey, Jeremy, have a good one. Thanks for all the info. Have a good right. night. So I thought it'd be uh, I thought it'd be cool to cover some of the questions I got in my comments. I don't know if Marty, if you have any good ones right off the bat for you. What was that? Uh, I got some, uh, you know, questions from our comment section on our YouTube's. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, so, uh, do you use any extra nutrients in the water, or is it just fish waste? Um, and that's from Umbra Gricola. Um, so we do actually add some nutrients. It just depends on what we're, what the plant needs, and what form of the life stage. Um, but we, you know, do use different mineral salts or, or you know, nutrient ferments or, or compost teas. Yeah, it kind of depends on what your original water source is. Like, obviously, if you're starting with RO water, for instance, you're going to have to add a lot more. Or if you have city water, for instance, you're going to have to add a lot more than, say, well water. Um, you know, so it kind of depends on where you start off. But eventually, no matter what, you're going to have to supplement certain things that just don't come in fish food. You're pretty much, uh, I would say, primarily nitrogen producing, you know, with a little bit of phosphorus. So uh, for the most part, everything else you'll have to supplement at least a little bit for cannabis obviously potassium would be i would say like the main ones and you'll need more phosphorus and you'll need more magnesium and you'll need more calcium you know like uh so you will need to supplement just because it's such a heavy feeder it'd be Iron, I was gonna say you're cucumbers or you're growing tomatoes or you're growing anything if you're you know in order to produce the fruit itself it needs to take up more nutrients than what aquaponics will provide. If you just want to grow lettuce forever, then you can have a perpetual system like that. So I had, uh, another question is, in aquaponic systems you have, is it okay to add additional nutrients? Like some of the people have great success with hydroponics or does that negatively affect the fish? Um, so that's the reason why we use the dual root zone methods, which we described really well in the first episode. And then I also have a, a separate breakdown video of it on my YouTube channel. And I think Marty might as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, so definitely check that out. Um, also notice you're using light tubing. Have you thought about high efficiency LEDs? Uh, would it hurt the fish? Um, yeah, we, I, I prefer using LEDs. Uh, we had Spectrum King on last week and that, that works really well. Um, you know, they're, they're honestly my best, uh, favorite lights at the moment in terms of how well they work, so. Yeah, and I think they have a wide variety of, you know, if you need a small light, you know, that covers a small footprint because you're only doing a, a closet size grow. Um, you know, I think you, you know, or if you're doing a large scale and you want to cover, you know, an entire room, you can get, you know, larger footprint lights and they cover the spectrum really well, pun intended, Spectrum King. Um, so I think there's that, and then there's a lot, you know, we have a lot of other LED information in general in our previous episodes. If anybody wants to check those out, we talk about LEDs come up a lot. It's one of those questions that comes up over and over again. Um, you know, so, and as far as the hydro nutrients go, you know, I would say, <coughs> uh, to a certain extent, a lot of the hydro 
nudes out there are going to be salt based and I, I wouldn't even personally put them in my dual root zone um, in terms of you're just talking about hydroponic stuff like anything from like general hydro or you know anything that's going to be a salt based uh, nutrient that's readily available to your plant while well, you can put it in I still wouldn't recommend it would prefer you know something like a dry amendment that you can water into your dual root zone uh, so you're not getting the, that salt buildup, especially in a dual root zone, because a lot of my root zones are relatively small. So it's not going to take a lot of salt buildup to start affecting the microbial life that we want to establish in there. So uh, that's my only caveat on even when you have a dual root zone, still be aware of what you're putting into your plants. Uh, you know, if you are going to do something, you know, like we talked about recharge earlier, that's a great option. Uh, to be able to add in. So while you, it gives you the ability to, I would still say anytime somebody says something like hydronutrients, I get a little bit jumpy because usually, you know, nine times out of 10, if you walk into a grow shop and pull a bottle off the shelf and go buy it, that's going to be a salt based nutrient that I feel like in the long run for what we're trying to do doesn't work. If you're trying to just grow a plant, you know, just cannabis itself in a like cocoa, some inert media, then, uh, you know, that you're going to throw out as soon as you're done with that particular run, then I could see maybe it would have a purpose, but that's my, it's my anti-salt speech for dual root zone. Yeah, you'd basically want to go with, if you did use a commercial store bought a nutrient, you'd want to use some products, not all are good, but you want to use some products that are on the, uh, of the, the, uh, organic line. Like, uh, Steve likes a couple of the, uh, the, uh, uh, amendments that they offer from Fox Farm. I think one's Kaching. I think he said in the past. I, mm -hmm. There's two. Oh yeah, there's one. ones that there's ones that you can use. But that was just so we we, we often cover different products that we find yeah. in hydro stores so that that and tell people if they're fish safe or not because people always don't have access to all the stuff that we tell people. Be, you know, hey, in the perfect world, you'd order this mineral salt or you'd, you'd order langbanite right. or you'd order dolomite or whatever. You know, sometimes people just need a quick grab what's in the store. So we often like to grab stuff off the store, look at different things that people offer us and say, hey, based on the ingredients, you know, is this okay? And then like, you know, how should you use 25%? Should you use 10%? Right. You know, right. And then how to adjust that. And that was the key that we learned in the past shows too, that when you do buy those store-bought nutrients that are made for hydroponics or, or a soil grow, even a soilless grow, cocoa or pro mix or whatever you want to, you probably want to look at possibly using no more than 25% and as low as maybe 10%, like Steve just mentioned. So you wouldn't use that as, as normally you'd be told, follow the directions on the bottle. In this case, no, you got to cut it down. You got to figure out, you know, what, what, it is that you need and and i think uh, getting into the when you're doing this getting into the getting your proper uh, measuring devices your your meters so that you can actually tell what you're adding to your water because the bottom line is like i think steve was getting at is you can't kill the fish well the other thing too is that or adding some of the, adding you know a smaller amount to your compost teas with your microbes and everything else and you know adding yeah. much much less adding five or ten percent of the dosage just enough to boost and have it available and then have those microbes you're brewing you know boost that up you know and and not so much use relying on it so heavily but making it highly available and then what you've taught us in the last three months is that the ferments in the labs that to me seems like the way to go if you want to add stuff and i guess there's maybe rock phosphate occasionally but i guess you guys have differing opinions some of you use it some of you don't use it uh, but but uh, I think what you, what we've been hearing from Grain Grow and Marty with the ferments, and uh, you talking about a lot in depth about the labs a couple of weeks ago, and we didn't have a, a guest. That's one of the great shows because there was so much just pure information where we were on topic for a long time, and I found that fascinating. Uh, to th and I think that's the answer to it. That's what you need to get into. You need to get into the fermentation that uh, the Korean grow. What what do they would call it, Marty? Can you help me there? Natural the farming is probably yeah. the you know, one of the major, you know, lines that does for me, I mean, there's a number of them, but Korean natural farming is one of the general terms uh, so, that comes up over and over again. Yeah. So look into that kind of thing. I think that's the way everybody's going. That's to having really good success. I might be wrong, but instead of worried about buying something from the store, get some fruit, 
like Marty's saying, get some blackberry or some blackberries or some plums or whatever's not locally available that's in your region. You know, that's it. You can go get off a tree because there's stuff that grows wild. There's stuff that people won't even care if they got a tree and stuff's falling in their yard. If you're polite, you go up there and you, you know, don't act like a thug. You know, they might okay. let you pick up all the fruit out their yard, you know, and so sure. you, you make a firm. And, and that's where your, a lot of your potassium and phosphorus can come from also. I believe, what did you, what else was mag, magnesium that you yeah, got? Magnesium, yeah, magnesium, potassium. You, yeah. and what you, you know, what you ferment obviously makes a difference. But one of the ones that I didn't mention before and that I'll mention now is uh, like watermelon rind. We just went through today and, you know, took apart a big watermelon and took the seeds out. I remember talking about with my son. Well, the next thing we'll probably do is take the, all the rind from that watermelon and cut it up and make a ferment out of that. Um, you know, the same thing you can do with like cucumber skins or, you know, a lot of different stuff, which again, you could just feed a lot of stuff to the worms, which I do uh, when I'm feeling lazy. For instance, I can just throw that in a worm bin and they'll eat it up just fine. But uh, the watermelon rind or cantaloupe rind or any of those, I feel like are, are a good option for doing ferments on because they're relatively easy to do. You know, otherwise you're pretty much just going to throw them away anyway. And, uh, <clears throat> and they're full of nutrients. Yeah, they're easy to break down. They're thin cellulose walls, all that good stuff. So cool. So, all right. Well, thank, thanks for your help there, Marty. You know, back to you, Steve. You got another question? <laughs> it's the Steve and yeah. Marty get Q and A show, and I'm just going to moderate. Yeah. Um. Let's see here. Trying to. Uh... Well, thanks for teaching me, guys, because so I could help you out with that question. That was kind of, you know. Hey, no problem. Have you got done any important yet, Roger? You got anything started? No, no, I'm busy. I'm trying to fix my damn lawn tractor. That it's like kind of hard to cut up fruit when you're underneath the lawn tractor trying to get a damn bolt that's been in there for ten years, you know, out. And it's true. Well, next time you buy a watermelon, just save the rind. So. It's good times, it's getting ready to be kind of time. It's about that time, almost around here. You know, I think it's just about that time. And get. Uh, in fact, I did. I I was in. Well, I was at Wally World the other day, and uh, and I saw these big old. And I'm like any big vessel, like you know. So they had these uh, like what do you call it? The that they feed horses horse troughs. You know, the metal horse troughs. The uh -huh. you know oblong look like a racetrack or something. You know. Well, I was like, how much are those? No, it was they were just there with full of watermelons. They weren't selling them, so. My excitement waned a little bit because I was more interested in the tub than the watermelons. But I don't have anybody to share a watermelon with. I'd be up to my ears in a watermelon if I bought a watermelon. Yeah, yeah we chop know. it up and freeze it really so we can put it in smoothies later. Yeah, That's it'd be sad saying. for me. Like, where's my family out there? We had a question. I've heard that if you grow certain things with weed, it can change the flavor a little. I'm wondering if this is real or just a myth. I would say it's definitely a myth in aquaponics. And I, I don't really see it making an if, a difference in your your terpenes by simply having a, the root system networked. Do you guys yeah, have a different I can't opinion? I that I've ever experienced that firsthand. I mean, maybe that's about all I can really say about it is that I don't, I mean, I'm not going to say anything definitive. I haven't conducted any scientific tests or anything, but I can tell you in my experience, I've never seen that. Um, I really think I've seen it. They're asking if it would be cross-pollination, I guess, is what they're really asking. And that's, you know, whether it affects yeah. any change of taste. That's hard, really. That's, why don't you try it for about 20 years? Come back and let us know. I always get that question, too. Like, does it make your weed <laughs> taste like fish poop? And it's like, I have no idea why you would think that's like... You don't ask that if somebody who grows a tomato. Like, does your tomato grow like fish poop? Like, no. It, it grows in cow shit, so, you know. Yeah, yeah you know, you... <laughs> Or worm shit. Like, nobody asks that. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. You know, or do your tomatoes taste like salt because you grew them with salt nutrients? You know? Yeah, do, do your tomatoes taste like though. fish? That's my favorite one. Does your weed yeah. taste like fish? We get or that one poop. all the yeah, time. That same thing all the time. Does it taste like fish or fish poop? And I'm okay. like, no, it doesn't at all. So, in case anybody's wondering. We got a question from Chad. Has anyone tried optimal fish food? 
aquaponic fish food, he says. I've been using it for six months. I don't know. I haven't used it. I know uh, Charlie Schultz has been using it a ton. And yeah. He loves it. Um, so. I mean, I don't, I guess I kind of went on like a little mini uh, food search not that long ago because I usually buy it relatively in bulk and it lasts me like a year and a half because um, I don't keep that many fish and, you know, mostly koi and couple of catfish and stuff, not too many. But uh, I couldn't really find anything that seemed different. Like they pretty much all, if you look at the guaranteed analysis of everything from like, uh, you know, your normal Tetra goldfish food, uh, you know, like the pellet food, um, or whether it was pellets from this company or pellets from like Purina catfish food uh, for like pond food or koi pond food or, like pretty much no matter what that, the guaranteed analysis was like less than 1% different on just about everything. And uh, so I haven't tried their food. I did look at the guaranteed analysis and look at it. I wouldn't say that I saw there was anything wrong with it. Um, I will say that it was probably cost was the main reason I didn't order it and chose to go with something else. So um, I couldn't find a big difference in, in fish food. Uh, so maybe Steve has something to add to that, but I don't. I don't know the differences. Uh, I know uh, we. I could definitely get someone on the show that could, but yeah, I'm kind of curious. Is, it, is are they making a claim that by using this food you get more minerals out of your fish waste, or it's supposed to it, be a little bit better balanced on certain? Okay, that's that's the point. Yeah. Okay, all right, that's yeah, what I thought. To be uh, but if you look at the guaranteed analysis they have posted on their website, it, you know, it just doesn't, uh, you know, you would think it, it would come out in the guaranteed analysis, I guess, is what I didn't, I didn't really understand. And I even emailed them and uh, I didn't get a response. So well, the it would be interesting to get somebody on that knows a little bit more about it. Cause I, you know, I just ended up ordering from my local co-op here, right. you know, they have fish food just for people that have sporting fish like bass and catfish and different stuff in their ponds so they carry big you know 40 50 pound bags for relatively cheap so that's where i got mine and just because right. i also like supporting my local co-op but i right. did go on sort of like a little mission to try to find out if there was like some food that was magically better or for aquaponics and i couldn't find anything definitive that said that especially that would justify the cost difference so yeah, well, we'll have to talk about not not tonight because we're running pretty long tonight anyway. But you know, one thing I'd like to talk about is like uh, how you guys out there went about setting up your co-ops. But that's for us. so I just want to bring it up that it'd be not, something nice to talk about on the show one night. How to go about setting up a, a co-op in your local area so that's, you can help local growers. I've been trying to do that, and it's a uh, bitch. That's yeah. not a one episode thing. That would be like a five. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. We'll see. How, like I said, it's a bitch. You know, I've been trying to do it for years and it just, oh man, you got it's tons of legwork and you know, oh man. But yeah, I did get a bunch of people to agree on stuff too. You know, and it. then you get some jackass councilman that comes in swoops in and bans us off all co-ops and all of your last eight years or six years or five years worth of work was all for naught. Yeah, I'm not sure they'd be able to do that around here, though. That's the one good part. Oh, about it. oh, yeah, that's that's what you think now. Well, Isn't that about cannabis. Look at my. Oh, no, no, it no, 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 has no, cannabis. I, we're not legal for cannabis, so I'm not talking about cannabis. Allegedly. Well, I know, but I'm saying they said the same thing. And actually, yeah, it could it could spill over into that, you know, allegedly, you know. Yeah. But. So Old Park Grow says he's been working on a poor man's lobster recipe for tilapia. <laughs> so what does that mean? We'll have to we'll have to see how that goes. I've I looked into making some of my own food. I have a a guy who oh. does an aquaponic source, um, or not the aquaponic source, but he has uh, he works at an aquaponic uh, farm where. Uh, they source their own um, black soldier fly larva that they process into food and sometimes feed the larva to at particular stages. <clears throat> I guess he was talking about the catfish don't really like him as much once they get kind of a hard shell on the outside of them, they get a little bit older. So he had a couple of ways of harvesting them. 
uh, maybe I'll see if I can get him to shoot some videos or something for us and, and do that. But there are obviously a number of different ways that you can make your own fish food uh, if you want to, but it's, it's fairly labor intensive, but um, black soldier flies, you know, I have my, again, uh, I'm a big advocate of child labor. So another thing I make my kids do is pick out red worms out of my red worm bin and feed them to the fish. And they actually love that because they can, you know, sort of throw them to them and the fish fight over them and stuff. So that's kind of fun, but that's not really like a, to, you know, that's not a complete diet for them all together. So, uh, you know, we usually only do that about, you know, once a week or so. But uh, there are a number of things you can do to make your own food, but most of them are labor intensive. Uh, roaches. Roaches are the best. Nothing beats doobia roaches or hissing cockroaches if you're feeding, especially larger fish. You, you can take all the roots, all the shit parts of your plants, keep them in a freezer with a couple of heat pads, and they'll just breed like crazy. And their waste is way better than even worm casings. It's cool. Roaches. I've heard yep. there's some beetles that work really well for that too. I saw somebody posted in one of the aquaponics groups that they they have some beetle that they got somewhere that basically they're using beetle castings um, to be able to break down food too. So I don't know what kind of beetle it was. It was like a long, long body. Did you see that post, Steve? No, I missed that. I missed that one. Might have been one of the ones you got banned from. You never know. <laughs> yeah. I don't keep track of them. Honestly, I'm so hard. Like, yeah, well, there are so many groups now. We've talked that about that before. What? We've talked about that before. Huh? You got a couple of groups where if you suggest something that's different, all of a sudden uh, you're a problem. Right. Right. And, I'm, you know, again, I'm probably, there's probably a solid dozen aquaponic groups that I'm a member of now that I just got added to or uh you know people tag me and post on so i joined to be able to see what was going on or different things like that so some of them even have the same name i think there's like three or four different groups that are just called aquaponics so that's super fun and uh so keeping track of what gets posted where is weird but the uh, i the beetles were it looked like really cool basically like a you know similar to black soldier fly bin style setup they just threw in food and broke it down like castings. And I, I assume you were saying uh, roaches would be pretty much the same thing, right? Yeah, except they breed faster and they're easier. Easier. And then you, what you do is you take like paper towel rolls or a couple pieces of PVC, you shake them into a Ziploc, zip it shut, throw it in the freezer, and um, you know for half an hour until they don't move anymore. Then feed them to your fish. Works great. They don't go nowhere. Works cool. awesome. Oh, so you so you you get, you put the food in there and you let them all inhabit and go get all big little the whole shitload of them in there eating the food and then you freeze them to kill them and feed your fish. Yep. How are they in terms of like you know nutrients for the fish? Oh, super the high in protein, super high in fat, uh, really good in calcium, magnesium, other nutrients. Plus, cool. you can recycle all your plant material, your roots, your leftover leaves, your your bait plants and, and all the, you know, anything else uh, you want back into them, you know, you kind of reuse all that, that stuff you're not using. Yeah. The same thing we do, I, or at least I do with my red worm bins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I throw root balls and pretty much everything in there. As long as it's not manure, pretty much stays, stays out or meat in general. Hmm. How would you contain roaches if you wanted to contain roaches in a farm? Oh, they're easy to contain. You just put them in a in a container with Vaseline around the top. They won't cross a one to two inch band That's of Vaseline. The Vaseline trick. Okay, That's yeah. what I was digging for. I was digging for the Vaseline trick. And now, yeah. what all kind of uh, little bugs and stuff for the Vaseline? See, what you talked about it a while back, and I didn't want to butt in, believe it or not. But what is it that <laughs> I see Marty smiling? I didn't want to butt in. So, but what is it that you know? What other, the what other bugs? What other bugs can you contain in a, like an open aquarium with with Vaseline? Anything? Else? Anything that doesn't fly. So worms. Yeah. So if you do worms or well anything that doesn't fly or jump high enough to get out, right? Yeah, anything that can't jump to the edge or fly. I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, worms at nighttime, you know, get extremely active on the surface. Oh, yeah, they'll leave. Crawl out and get all over the place. But they won't go past the Vaseline. Nope. And that's like three <laughs> inches, right? You put a coat of three inches around the No, they inside. just don't like Vaseline. <laughs> they just don't like it. <laughs> Sis. 
No, but you, I said you have to put three inches. Didn't you say to put like a coat down from the top, mm -hmm. like three inches around it? Or, okay. Yep, one to, one to two inches usually is fine. No, oh, okay. Well, thanks. A, a perimeter. Yep. Well, I have a project I'm going to try. <laughs> it involves Vaseline. It involves roaches in an aquarium. And, and Vaseline. Yeah, and Vaseline, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, you got anything else you guys want to touch on this week? If not, that was a pretty good episode. No, and I'm no, good. I actually have to get going too, so appreciate you guys. You guys uh, yeah. want to look me up, AP Meds, on uh, YouTube. Uh, Patreon, if you want to check out some of my fruit ferments and different stuff like that, a little more how-to videos. Uh, we got uh, so patreon.com slash AP meds, all that stuff should be in the description. Um, Aquaponic Cannabis Growers Group on Facebook is the one that we generally, you know, kind of revolves around the podcast and people involved with it. So definitely check us out there. Um, we have a, the online class coming up after Steve's class, which yeah, is the 19th and 20th. Yep, it's 19th and 20th, so if anyone's looking to take the aquaponic cannabis class, definitely check that out. Totally forgot about that. You're absolutely right. Um, I'm going to have the cameras uh, the cameras set up in a stream, set up on the laptop so that uh, people can follow along and you know be able to ask questions and chat and all, and, and Marty will be there as well. And Marty will have content from his stuff and all, so it'll be dope. Yep, so uh, all that you know is in place. I had hoped that my side-by-side -side would have been relatively farther along and we could cover that a little bit more in that class, but we'll have to see. It may just be two plants growing side-by-side -side as opposed to an actual side-by-side uh, -side test, but uh, at least we'll have you know those to work with. Um, Something to talk about. Uh, anything else going on? Steve's podcast coming up on, uh, was it Mondays, right? You do the... Well, week yep, last week in cannabis, we've been uh, following a couple of different states' bills, and it's been really fun talking about the different things each week, doesn't it, Roger? Well, well, actually, keeping up with something you wouldn't yeah. you wouldn't normally keep up with because it's not in my state. Yeah, so yep. I mean, I'd like to know about it to help other people, but yeah, we've been keeping up with some interesting stuff that's going on. Good stuff too. Some positive notes, believe it or not. Yep. You have to catch the show on Monday to find out what's positive about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously if you guys have any questions, always feel free to message us directly. Yep. Uh, so yeah, you guys have a good night. I'm going to take off. I'll see you guys later. Also, you want to tell people how to find you and your Patreon and the rest? I just did that. Oh, I guess I'm just stoned. I thought okay. you were sleeping. Okay. How, about, how about you, Roger? <laughs> hey, y'all, drop by and join a, a community forum at I Love Growing Marijuana dot com. We've got an excellent blog with over five hundred articles on everything you can imagine about how to grow cannabis indoors, outdoors, in whatever, and uh, some really good science about it behind it. Um, and uh, if you want to buy some flower power nutrients, go to I Love Growing Supplies dot com and check them out. <laughs> Shout out to uh, to Old Fart Grows and Chad. He says, thanks for sharing your frontal lobes. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> we love this show, and uh, it's fun having a cool place to hang out with a bunch of other like-minded growers and, and, and stuff like that. It's awesome. Great guests, too. Great guests. Yeah. Yeah, we even, who would have thought of making a, a packaging that interesting, you know? You know I, knew, I knew it was going to be cool, really neat, to talk about the different kinds and delivery methods and things. I thought that was really neat. I think we learned a, a lot of cool stuff, so. So before we go, we have to thank Jeremy from Andler Packaging yep. in Maryland uh, for coming on and then explaining a lot of the ins and outs and what's going on these days in all the different packaging. Yep, and right. his information is in the description if you guys are checking, want to check that out. And uh, be sure to check out Ouroboros Farms, uh, ouroborosfarms.com. And then if you're looking to take the online class, um, you know, check out my website, Um to, uh, It'll be kind of simultaneous um, but uh, it's just two different methods because of how the of this how uh, the back end works for us so um, yeah uh, uh, I guess trying to think if there's anything else 
Um, yeah, they have their commercial class on the 11th, 12th, and 13th, uh, and then the the medicinal herb class on the 15th and 16th. So, um, yeah, definitely check that out. Um, hopefully, we'll have some pretty cool content uh, from Washington. Have a quick trip up there to do some cool cannabis-related things. We'll see. May or may not end up having any video content that I can share with you guys or not. I gotta find out. If not. We'll have some, uh, some interesting other content just uh, on the road content for a little bit. So, all righty. Um, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, we'll catch you guys later. And um, I think that's it. Have a good one. And I'll see you guys on Monday. Good night, y'all. Thanks for joining.